Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Have you ever considered the different reactions the people had to Jesus' resurrection? No? Well, today we'll be looking at a lot of those different reactions. So what I would like for you to do is take everything that you know, clear it out of your brain like you've never read the Bible. You're back in that day. <laughs> now, I know that you're not one of the, the disciples because if you were, we would have read your name in the book. But that doesn't mean that you weren't one of the folks that were standing around on the outside that were followers of Jesus. We know there's a lot of them. So think about the things that took place on that, that Friday. You may have been standing around and you may have been watching the, the Jesus go through and be tried and beat. You may have even been there and watched him crucified. You'd have been with only one disciple, but you'd have been with a handful of other folks that were followers of Jesus that were not necessarily afraid, but you had that heart-filled sorrow. And you watched him die. You watched him taken down from the cross, and you watched where he was put in the tomb. And then you left, because the Sabbath was there. You may not have known what exactly was going to take place. You may have been so sad that you forgot everything that Jesus had said. But the third day comes around, and something miraculous happened. We're going to be looking at the stuff at that point in time that the people believed in the past. And then we'll think about the present day and future and the things that, well, we might have reactions to when Christ comes back. When you look at how individuals reacted to Jesus' resurrection, you see a combination of perplexity, confusion, astonishment, dismissal and denial. You see unmatched joy and even sanctioned lies and invented story and payoffs from those who were the religious leaders of the day. And as mentioned, what is interesting is that these past reactions, well, they give us a glimpse, a small glimpse of the reaction still to come at the soon coming resurrection and rapture of the church. Let's start off, and we're, our main scripture today is going to be coming out of Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at the early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things uh, to the eleven and to the, all the rest. Now there were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James, also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Let's break this down just a little bit. The story begins with what? A group of women, including Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, according to Mark uh, 16, verses 1 through 4. They came to the tomb bringing various spices and further anointment and balms 
to completely to complete the embalming of Jesus. They're on their way to the tomb. And they're thinking to themselves as they're going along, oh, well, how are we going to get the stone rolled away? How are we going to be able to do the complete the burial process if that stone's there? And from this, we see right away that the resurrection wasn't on their minds. They weren't expecting what they experienced. Even though Jesus had repeatedly told everyone and the disciples that he would rise on the third day, they were still coming with the expectation of anointing a dead body. Is there any doubt in your mind that that's true? There's none in mine. But with God, with God, we should expect the unexpected. Now, we know that this occurred on the first day of the week. How do we know that? Well, Mark 16, 9 tells us, Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. It's also important to remember that God gave a feast day to Israel called First Fruits which is an annual pointer of Jesus' resurrection. Now, we've been looking for the last couple weeks at what Daniel said, what Isaiah said about the resurrection that was to come, with little hints of the rapture. And everything pointed to this, to this one point in time. Now, God... He said that this feast followed the Passover. And he was very specific for the Feast of First Fruits, but he did not do what? He did not give it an actual date. But saying it occurred on the day after the Sabbath. Now, I don't know about you, but last time I checked, the Sabbath is on a Saturday. This is why when I look at our friends from the Seventh-day Adventists, I say, well, you can say that everything's on Saturday. That's fine. But he rose on Sunday. Which, of course, is the first day of the week. And I don't mean that just by looking at our calendar, our current calendar. Because I know the calendars are a little bit different from the past. But still, the first day of the week is the day after Sabbath. And that always fell on what we would consider Saturday. And when did it start? Well, man, it started way, way back way back after they were re, re, uh, uh, the exodus from Egypt. Leviticus 23, 9 through 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I'm going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And guess what? He shall wave that sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the first day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. That's when they're going to do it, the first day afterwards. According to Scripture, Joseph of Arimathea had provided his own new tomb, which had been cut out of the rock for a burial place for Jesus. This fulfilled the great prophecy that's found in Isaiah 53, 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, unlike Jesus' own disciples, the Jewish leaders remembered. They remembered what Jesus had said, that he would rise from the dead, and were worried that his disciples would even try to steal the body to make it look like that this happened. So they made sure that the whole tomb was heavily guarded. And it was even sealed. Matthew 27, 62 through 66. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, and I just love that, Sir, <laughs> we remember that when he was still alive, the deceiver said, After three days I'm going to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. 
the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure along with the guard. They set a seal on the stone. Now, if it had been nowadays, with the stuff that they have, they'd have had that, that great big 15-inch thick steel plated door with the big spinner doodad with 50,000 <laughs> locks on it, chained. They'd have had all kinds of seals on it. They'd have put a tank in front of it, along with a, a, a whole regiment of soldiers armed to the teeth, if it would be in current times. And do you think that that still would have held him? No. No, heck no. <laughs> so the tomb was guarded by a large stone, which took several people to move, and it could not be moved from the inside. There was nothing to grip onto. You couldn't even, it was so heavy, you couldn't be a single person and push it over because it was in a track. So it was a little difficult. The armed Roman soldiers who guarded the tomb with their careers and possibly lives on the line if anything went wrong. And this is why I really did kind of enjoy the thing that Caroline sent me with the guards guarding a dead man. Of course, it only showed two guards and they were just having a good time by themselves, just being silly. Yep, here we are. Guarding a dead man, <laughs> as if he's ever going to get out. We'd like to see that. <clears throat> the Roman seal upon the stone, which was backed by the full force and authority of the Roman Empire. And this is what these women remembered on the way there to the tomb to anoint and finish the embalming process for Jesus. They were trying to figure out how we're going to get that stone rolled away. Oh, maybe we can coax the soldiers to move it. I don't know. They were astonished to find it already rolled away. Luke 24, verses 2 and 3. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Notice when they arrived, there were several oddities that were found. The stone was moved. The seal was broken, the guards were missing, and more importantly, there was no Jesus. To say that they were perplexed would be a minor statement. So what happened? Who moved the stone? Where was Jesus? For crying out loud. Did the disciples take the body as the chief, uh, chief priests were, uh, had earlier feared? Well, or had Jesus conquered death as he said he would? Now, I remember, I don't even think they were thinking of that at this point in time. All they knew is they saw their teacher, their master, had died, was crucified. Of course, you know the answer. Because, okay, I, I'll, I'll allow you to come back to current times and know everything you know that you've read in the Bible. <laughs> or at least I hope you know that answer. Luke 24, verses 4 through 8. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. <laughs> Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee? saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Now the Bible is very clear. It's very clear on who moved the stone. Matthew 28, 2 says, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And let me just add, that it wasn't just the earth that shook that day. Remember those tough Roman soldiers that had been assigned to guard the tomb? Well, they were shaking as well. They experienced the earthquake and saw the angel 
And as Matthew 28, 4 tells us, the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. <laughs> they all passed out. I'm kind of curious of when this happened, because we know this is before the sunrise, if that's what woke all the women up to say, oh, it's no longer the Sabbath. We need to go and anoint Jesus' body. And why they get there, and the stones rolled away, and the guards are not there, and Jesus is not there, And what them guards do when they woke when they woke up from being passed out? Well, they got the heck out of there, that's for sure. It's just like the said Chet showed in the video. The stone was rolled away and they all went, uh oh. <laughs> they got the heck out of there. And they were not present when the women arrived. Because I'm pretty darn sure we would have been told. They were there if they were there still. So it was the angels, just like it was when during Jesus' birth, that declared what took place with the Messiah. They were the ones that got to announce the resurrection. And I love how they did it saying, why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Now, I can still kind of picture my, in my mind, my silly mind, that the angel would have would, would sat there and looked at him and went, but why? Why are you here? Now, the women... And later the disciples had either forgotten what Jesus had said about the resurrection or they didn't take it seriously. But it kind of makes me wonder why they wouldn't take it seriously if they had watched Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, if he could do that, why wouldn't he be able to raise himself? Well, because no one else had ever raised themselves before. They came expecting to find the dead in the place of the dead. But Jesus wasn't dead. He was alive just as he said he would be after three days. It is the resurrection of Jesus that sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Only Christianity has an empty grave. We're the only ones. If you go to Jerusalem today, now, I've never been to Israel, but boy, have I seen pictures. It's kind of like it is in Turkey. When you're driving through the mountains, if you look to the side, there are graves everywhere. Everywhere. And you're going to find a lot of graves in Jerusalem surrounding it and all the hills and everything else. And you're going to, they're going to find that they're all filled with bones, but not those of Jesus. Why? Because he's not there. Now, let's make some quick points concerning the resurrection. It is the resurrection that was the only sign that Jesus would give to an unbelieving Israel. Matthew 12, 38 through 40 tells us. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It is the resurrection that confirmed Jesus' words right here. And thus the truth of Christianity itself that's found in Acts 2 verses 23 to 24. It is the resurrection that demonstrates that humanity's greatest enemy, which is death, has been defeated and removes its fear from all who follow Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm not worried about death. I know where I'm going. 
Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. According to, according to Romans 8.11, it is the resurrection that gives us the power of our lives for today for believers to follow a risen Lord. It is the resurrection that gives us sure, the, gives sure and certain hope of the future for those that are Christ, for his experience as the first fruits from the dead. It will be ours. We can reference 1 Peter 1 3 and 1 Corinthians 15 20 through 23. Luke 24 9 through 12 tells us, and they returned from the tomb and reported everything. They reported everything to the 11 and to all the rest. Now, I love it when it tells us all the rest because remember I asked you to be part of, put yourself back in those days, you would be part of all the rest. Now, there were Mary Magdalene and Johanna, the, the mother, uh, and Mary, the mother of James. Also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrapping only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what, he had, what had happened. We know from one of the other books that Peter was not the only one that ran to the tomb. John went with him, and John beat him in the foot race. And, but John did not enter the tomb. Peter probably knocked him out of the way. Get out of the way when he got there and went inside. But after that, they all believed. They marveled. Let's explore the reactions of the three different groups of people. The first to start off with the followers of Jesus. We've already seen the first reaction of the women who came to the tomb. It said they were perplexed at the empty tomb. This word has the thought of not knowing how to proceed, determine, speak, or act. They were just overwhelmed. Wouldn't you be? If you went to this tomb and there's no Jesus and two sparkling dudes are sitting there and they tell you, what the heck are you doing here? He is not here. Don't you remember what he told you? They were overwhelmed. They simply couldn't believe or understand what they were seeing. Now as they returned and reported all that had happened to the disciples, initially we see them, they're very dismissive. You could say that the first unbelievers of the resurrection were the disciples. It was them. They thought the story was nonsense, a foolish, idle tale. It couldn't have happened. It just couldn't have. But what if? What if they were right? Didn't Jesus say that he would rise from the dead for three days? So Peter and John, with heightened curiosity and hope, they took off running, and they got there. And guess what? All they saw was empty linen. There was no Jesus. It was just as them crazy women had said. Peter returned marveling at what happened. And that word, marveled, means a wonder, to be struck with admiration or astonishment. Later, when Jesus himself appeared to the disciples, we see a new reaction, a brand new one. The wonder and amazement turns to joy. Luke 24, 36 through 41. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands, my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. 
And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Remember, they were locked away because they were afraid. There was no way anybody was coming through that locked door without them opening it. And yet, here's Jesus standing amongst them. <clears throat> we have the early reactions to the resurrection of Jesus. We've seen the initial perplexity, the doubting, and even dismissal. Then the heightened hope and curiosity, the astonishment, and the marveling. And it ends with complete joy, complete joy and amazement when they see Jesus. So his disciples were finally in the presence of the risen Lord. There's mega joy. And then they had to eat. The dead do not eat. Ghosts do not eat. <laughs> Spirits do not eat. But the risen Lord, he said, do you have something to eat? Now let's look at the religious leaders. Would news that he may have be alive please them? <laughs> oh no, not in the least. The Gospel of Matthew fills in the details of how the Jewish leaders and the chief priest reacted to the news. Matthew 28, verses 11 through 15. Now while they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Excuse me. How did they react? Well, they lied. They lied. They invented a false story and paid the guards off to maintain and spread the lie. They actively worked to suppress the truth. Sounds a lot like politicians today and the leaders of today. I mean, think about it. Think about it. And I, and I was going to put this in later on, but just remember this. Just remember this itself. What is it that Joe Biden, the Biden, did the other day? Transgender Recognition Day. He declared today... He just, he just acknowledged it because it's been going on for 10 years. Has it really? What? March 31st. Oh, has it on March 31st? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I thought this was the first time in the, the yeah. transgender day of visibility. So for 10 years, okay, oh, for 10 years, yeah, 10 years, we've, 15, whatever, we've, st yeah. we've started this lie. On what day? The holiest day, the absolute holiest day of Christians and Catholics. He rose on this day. Now, the chief priest that their falsehood was obviously successful. Obviously successful. Because he says that this, uh, when Mark wrote this uh, uh, gospel 20 to 30 years later, he says that this story, this false story, was still widely believed by the Jews of that day. I think it's still alive and well today. The next group we have is Satan and the fallen angels. Now the Bible doesn't give necessarily Satan's reaction to the resurrection directly, but you can certainly imagine Satan had after he'd entered into Judas to portray Jesus and would have been gloating over the Son of God on the cross. <laughs> I finally got the sucker. Now I've got him. He can no longer do what was been promised. But I don't believe that he understood exactly what was going to take place. 
I don't think he understood just what the cross meant and what the resurrection truly meant, especially for his own defeat and destruction. Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. Because Jesus rose, it has canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, you and me, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He took all of our sins when we accept him as the resurrected Savior. Everything we took, he's nailed to that cross. The devil has no power over us. Death has no power over us. There was a hidden wisdom and mystery in the cross and the resurrection that was so great, even the rulers of the age, including the falling angelic realm, they just didn't see it. It took them by surprise. And the Bible tells us that if they had understood it, they would not have <coughs> crucified him. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 8. Yet, we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And we know that the people, if they would have understood, they wouldn't have done it either. We know this when Peter gave his message in Acts. And when he had told them everything, it cut them to the quick and they pleaded, how, how do we make amends for this? Repent, be baptized, and believe. Now all of this is interesting, but... Does it have any pointers to the coming resurrection and rapture of the believers? What were those early reactions again? Well, there was a mixture of perplexity, doubt, dismissal, curiosity, marveling, astonishment, and unrelenting joy, and an attempted cover-up with a fabricated story to explain why the body of Jesus was missing. Now cast your thoughts into the future. Cast them way there in the future. If I had a teleportation machine, we'd go to the future. But, well, we haven't invented one of those yet. <laughs> Cast them thoughts to the future and the rapture, when instead of one missing body, there will be millions. Millions. If there was perplexity because of one empty tomb, imagine the perplexity and the confusion when the graves of all the believers are open and millions of living saints disappear. There will be doubt and outright dis uh, dismissal by many, of course. Like the resurrection of Jesus, the truth will be too much for most of them to handle. Isn't that what we're told today? But some who have been previously been told by their parents and friends about what will happen, they will now believe. There will be more than enough evidence for those whose hearts desire to know the truth. But like Jesus' resurrection, a story will need to be invented to explain what has happened. A lie for sure, but one believable enough to deceive the masses. Hmm, I wonder what that lie could be. I wonder what has been around for a while now. What type of story could possibly be great enough to explain the instant disappearance of millions of people? I mean, that is not something that just happens. But we've been groomed for it for a long, long time. It was hard enough for the Jewish leaders to explain one missing body of Jesus, but millions missing? How? Why? It is interesting that the preparation for it for the coming resurrection and rapture of the church, such a story has been crafted and told. That story has been prepared 
and declared and has been for the last 50 to 60 years. Do you know what it is? I bet you do. <laughs> Aliens! Oh, heavens, yes. <laughs> the aliens came and took all the people. Mm -hmm. The late Chuck Missler, who I just absolutely adored, and Mark Eastman in their book, Alien Encounters, quote, new agers and channelers who have received messages from so-called alien, be alien beings and reality demons, describing the coming sudden evacuation of those who ultimately are holding back the earth. Thus, the story has already been being written concerning how and why millions of people will suddenly be gone. The aliens beamed them up and took them away. And they wanted to have a little bit of dead bones to do it too, you know. That's why the graves are open. <laughs> it is a dramatic fulfillment pictured in the fabricated story of what happened to Jesus. Yet this coming story will be accompanied by all sorts of signs and wonders and satanic deception. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. And speaking of Satan, what do you think his reaction will be to the resurrection and rapture of the church? It is very likely that as we go up, he comes down permanently. You can wave to him as he comes down. <laughs> Would it be mean to laugh? Ha uh ha. -huh. Enjoy your short time. He's not going to be happy. His reaction is one of anger and wrath. For he suddenly knows that his time is really very short. Revelation 12, verses 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the, salva now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing he has only a short time. Think about that reaction, the disciples. Uh, the, think about that the reaction, the disciples, when Jesus stood in their midst. It get, again gives a glimpse of what our reaction, reaction might be when we are finally face to face with Jesus. Luke 24, 41. While they could still not believe it because their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything to eat? When Jesus came and stood in their midst, the, their very midst, the Bible says that because of the pure joy and overwhelming amazement, they still couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that this was actually real, that this was actually happening. It was too good, too incredible, too amazing. They may have been pinching each other. Is he real? He's speaking. He wants us to touch him. He's hungry. Jesus is alive. Slapping themselves. Wake up, wake up. This has got to be it. No, he's really here. But I saw him die. And yet here he is. He's alive and well. Does this not give a small glimpse of what it will be like at the resurrection and rapture of the church? The overwhelming joy, the marveling, the amazement, the sense, even that this can't be real for it's too good to be true. And yet it is true. Imagine the realization that you are now standing in the presence of the one who created all things, who suffered for all sins, 
and who rose defeating all enemies. Imagine standing in the presence of God Almighty, Jesus Christ. If it was too much for the disciples when they saw Jesus after the resurrection, try imagining how overwhelming it's going to be for us. To be standing in heaven with angels, with your believing friends and family, with the entire church of all races, nations, and ages, worshiping the King of Kings. John 20, 29. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. When doubting Thomas doubted that resurrection, he saw the risen Lord. All he could say was, My Lord, my God. The resurrection for Thomas not only proved the words of Jesus, it proved his deity. He realized that he was standing next to Emmanuel, God with us. And all believers will get that experience. We're all going to get to experience it. But what will our reaction be? I do not really think that any of us truly know. But I think that old Bart Miller, I think that he probably said it best in that song. You know, that one that made him famous? I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Let's go to prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father.